Hi everyone, welcome to Confirmation This Week. We are going to be looking at Judges and David. So the Judges first. Uh, so if you remember last week, we were just learning about the promise, the Israelites reaching the promised land, and they are being led by Joshua at that point. And so after they get into the promised land, what becomes the country of Israel, uh, they don't have a real head person. There's not a president or a king in charge of everything. Instead, they have these groups of people called judges who aren't just in charge all the time. They sort of show up and are chosen to be in charge when difficult things happen. And so uh, we're going to learn about them. And then after that, we're going to learn a little bit about the first kings. We're going to learn about Saul, who is the very first king, and David mainly. But let's watch our video now on Judges. Ah! Ta-da! Hi, Jerry! Hi, children. Got some good news for your three-part production of Judges. Uh, Mr. Adderton, the theater manager, has arranged for three unique guest directors to teach you kids Wait, a... guest directors? But we've proven ourselves mature and capable. Eh, uh, object all you like, but old Jerry's orchid hunting in the Everglades until next Thursday. And you need supervision. What could possibly happen? Oh, oh. Ms. Asimov's in charge today. Give her your full attention and respect. Goodbye, children. See Bye, you. Have a good trip. Hello, children. <laughs> Excellent reaction. Now we will begin, no? I will not bore you with my long list of accomplishments. I directed my first full production at the age of 11. Even leaders need guidance, Miss Frederick. Pay attention, you'll learn something, yeah? The piece I would like to explore with you concerns the judge Deborah. God sent Deborah to save the Israelites from their enemies and from themselves, which was an unlikely choice as women at that time were typically regarded as property. All of you, line up! You! Me? Yes. Break from the chorus. Fill your spirit with Deborah. Five, six, seven, eight, and lead, and lead, and advise, and lead. Now, go tell Barak to rise up and fight Sisera's army of 900 iron chariots. Now on to victory. Let me see your victorious jazz hands. Jazz hands, everyone. My name is Lionel Cashbeard, and I am a minimal theater artist. I want to thank you all for having me. I want to thank the space for having me. So thank you. And thank you, space. Let's all thank the theater space. Thank, thank you, space. space. So the Judge Gideon leads an army of 10,000, and God has him send all but how many home? 300, Mr. Cashbeard. Correct. Now how would we stage that? What about this broken broom? I'm confident its hidden energy could be unleashed to suggest 10,000 soldiers. That's absurd. It's a broom. Can't be 10,000 soldiers. And you can't defeat 10,000 soldiers with only 300. But Gideon did it. God uses absurd strategies to accomplish God's purposes. So why should we be any different? Let's thank the broom. Thank, thank you, broom. broom. Thank you, broom. I'm Jackson Python. Can I ask what the shield is for? To shield me from arrows, stones, spears, and the blood of my enemies. Oh, okay. We will explore the Israelite judge, Samson. We will open with a fire dance. Samson was a loose cannon. The Israelite people never knew what he would do next. Let us evoke that same terror and uncertainty in the audience. Dance! Dance haphazardly with the open flame! I'm really not feeling safe right now! Fantastic! And now we need the lion. Lion? Like a lion lion? Of course! How else could we authentically experience Samson tearing apart a lion with his bare hands? Ha 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 I am your master, lion! <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is not going well! <sighs> Samson tore down the false temple. A final homicidal act uh, in a life filled with homicidal acts. 
How do we stage this? Mr. Python, we really don't want you to overexert yourself. You were just mauled by a lion. Let's tear down the theater with our bare hands. You, take me to the main support beam. I want to go home. Uh, children, help me. Help me tear down the theater and kill 10,000 Philistines. <laughs> Howdy ho, kids. Jerry! How were the guest directors? Cool! Terrifying! I'd say we have mixed feelings about all the directors. Well, these guest directors might not be what you were expecting or hoping for, but neither were many of the judges God appointed to protect and preserve the Israelites during a very difficult period. When God uses someone flawed or downright strange as a leader, on the surface, it may not make a lot of sense. But you have to remember that receiving leadership from other people is one of the many ways that God is looking out for us and shaping us to be leaders to others. Uh, almost there! So the time of the judges is this time of sort of cycle, uh, just sort of repeats. So uh, the God's people would stray from God. They would worship idols and the gods of other kingdoms around them, and they'd get in trouble. They'd end up in hot water, as it says. And then they'd go, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that. And they would ask God to send them a judge to lead them and protect him. And the judge would get them out of trouble. And then once the judge was done being in charge, they would just do the same thing again. And they'd get in trouble again. And they'd fall back into these old patterns. And the cycle starts over again. And so each time it was a different judge. Uh, one of the ones I want to read for our Bible reading today is, or for this part, is from Judges 4. And she, this is going to be one of the judges. Her name is Deborah. So uh, after Ahud had died, Ahud was the judge before this. So Ahud led them out of them doing bad things. And now they're doing good things again. And after Ahud died, the Israelites again did things that the Lord saw as evil. So the Lord gave them over to King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, and he was stationed in Haraseth HaGoim. That's fun to say, isn't it? The Israelites cried out to the Lord because Sisera had 900 iron chariots and had repressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophet, was the wife of Lapidoth who was a leader of Israel at that time. She would sit under Deborah's palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the Ephraim highlands, and the Israelites would come to her to settle disputes. She sent word to Barak, Abinom's son, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Hasn't the Lord Israel's God issued you a command? Go and assemble at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 men from the people of Naphtali and Zebulun. Uh, if you remember, Naphtali, well, probably don't remember, but Naphtali and Zebulun are two of the sons of Jacob. And so they're two of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he said, take people from those two tribes of people and take them with you. And I'll lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, to assemble with his chariots and troops against you at the Kishon River. And then I'll help you overpower him. Barak replied to her, If you'll go with me, I'll go. But if not, I won't go. Deborah answered, I'll definitely go with you. However, the path you're taking won't bring honor to you, because the Lord will hand over Sisera to a woman. Then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. He summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men marched out behind him. Deborah marched out with him too. Here ends the reading. They march out and they destroy their those other people and they 
get back uh, ruling over themselves. So it's crazy because this is one of the first women who get this much power in the Bible. Um, and because she was a woman, Deborah might have been the most surprising choice of all the judges. Female leadership was completely unheard of during the time that Deborah was leading Israel. So God's choice shows us that God doesn't care about social convention. God chooses the best man or woman for the job. So even though Barak was the leader, it was Deborah who was in charge of everything. Leader of the army. Deborah was in charge of everything. He wouldn't even do it if she didn't go with. So that's sort of a cool story. So our discussion question in this part is who has God sent to help you through tough stuff? How did they help you? Uh, the easy answer, of course, is saying something like your parents. But what if, could you think of somebody who's not your parents? Um, I think of people who have helped me in during hard times of like maybe a pastor, maybe a school teacher. If you had a teacher at school who's ever helped you, maybe you're doing something and you didn't really want to talk to your mom and dad. So you talk to your school teacher, uh, a neighbor, a uh, there's lots of different things. You try to think of somebody besides just saying your mom and dad and think about it. So. so after all the judges come up and lead, the people all complain that they want the kind they want to have the kind of leadership that the other people do. They want kings like the other countries around them. And the first king is Saul. But he isn't a very good king. He's okay. He's good, but he's not great. He does some things, though, that God doesn't like. And so God says, Samuel, who's the prophet, I want you to go anoint a new person to be the next king instead of whoever Saul wants to be the next king. So let's watch our video on that. Ah! Ta-da! Trying to get a piece of that sweet student council treasure, eh? Oh, hi, Todd. I took what Jerry said to us the other day to heart. Leaders do help others. And I found a big opportunity to do that by becoming student council treasurer. I'm modeling my campaign after King David. The same King David we're doing our next play on? Yes. He's the perfect example of a great leader and was a faithful servant of God. <clears throat> And if elected treasurer, I promise to lead with the same humility and integrity as King David. I will also institute hot dog and hamburger Fridays. Vote Becky Frederick! Woo! Yes! Hot dogs! Man, Becky, that was great! You got my vote for sure. Hey, do you need help with any of the campaigning? That'd be fantastic! Who are you up against? M Mike Bowman? He's super nice and uber well-liked. There's not really any way you'll be able to attack him and come away clean. <laughs> I don't want to attack him. I'll do the mudslinging for you so your hands won't get any blood on them. Todd, you can't have integrity and run a negative campaign. King David wouldn't sling mud and neither will I. Oh, wow, Beck, you're a natural. Condemn it publicly, condone it privately. Uh, I don't condone it at all! This is our last communication concerning our tactics. Old Todd's going rogue. Samuel! Fill your hall with oil and go to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But if King Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. To Bethlehem, anoint the one I'd indicate. Jesse, how are we? I'm here to anoint one of your sons king. Take your pick. Nope. No, nah, no, 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 no. Are these all the sons you have? Well, there is still the youngest. He is tending sheep. Wise and anoint him. This is the one. The Lord looked past physical appearance into David's heart and saw that he was a man of faithfulness. I am Saul, the corrupt, wicked, demon-infested incumbent king. Like all entrenched political figures, Saul had grown corrupt and evil. Are there examples of King Saul in your own lives? Student treasurer incumbent Mike Bowman seems the obvious example, but are there others? Think on it at intermission. Todd, stop doing this! Stop doing this right now! You have no say in my actions, as I am an independent political entity in no way connected to the campaign. 
as a show of appreciation for my capable rival, Becky Frederick, the Mike Bowman campaign wants to buy her entire audience ice cream. Yeah! Todd, take the gloves off. <laughs> I mean in the campaign. Ooh, even better. Bam, 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 Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. I, the evil and wicked King Saul, fear that David will gain too much of the popular vote and- Psst, Tina, script change. My lame ice cream giveaway attempt did not work. David must be killed. Kill David. But I am too elusive to be so easily slain. Some urge me to kill you, Saul, but I spare you. You are more righteous than I. <sighs> Just as Becky Frederick is more righteous than Mike Bowman. Bow! Before your intelligent, creative, intuitive, but analytical, risk-taking, good-natured, independent, future student treasurer, who, by the way, has excellent posture. Not like Mike Bowman, that's slouch. Ladies and gentlemen, you can sit here and watch this propaganda, or you can join me at the park for an impromptu pizza party. Yeah! Pizza party! Sorry, Beck, but pizza's thicker than water. Hey, Mike! Wait for me! What have I done? This isn't how I wanted this to go. <gasps> Becky, you went astray from the path of faithfulness. I did? How? A truly righteous person is someone who has no interest in what people think of them, but only what God is calling them to do. But student treasurer is my calling! Then you must demonstrate that with your actions, not with your boasts. That was mostly Todd. Yes, but you did not denounce his shenanigans as you should have. David, too, went astray, but he showed great remorse and returned to God with humility. You can be redeemed as well, Becky Frederick. You mean that student treasurer is still within my grasp? Should you be given the honor, be so righteous, be so faithful in service that all treasurers henceforth shall be compared to you. I will, Talking Crown. I will. So our Bible reading is that time when Samuel goes to anoint King who will be David, who will become King David. So let's read 1 Samuel 16. Samuel did what the Lord instructed. When he came to Bethlehem, the city elders came to meet him. They were shaking with fear. Do you come in peace, they asked? Yes, Samuel answered. I've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Now make yourselves holy. Then come with me to the sacrifice. Samuel made Jesse and his sons holy, invited them to the sacrifice as well. When, Samuel, when they arrived, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, That must be the Lord's anointed right in front. But the Lord said to Samuel, Have no regard for his appearance or stature, because I haven't selected him. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. Next, Jesse called for Abimadab, who presented himself to Samuel. But he said, the Lord hasn't chosen this one either. So Jesse presented Shema. But Samuel said, no, the Lord hasn't chosen this one. Then Jesse presented seven of his sons to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't picked any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, is that all of your boys? There is still the youngest one, Jesse answered, but he's out keeping the sheep. Send for him, Samuel told Jesse, because we can't proceed until he gets here. So Jesse sent and brought him in. He was reddish brown and had beautiful eyes and was good looking. The Lord said, that's the one, go anoint him. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him right there in front of his brothers. The Lord's spirit came over David from that point forward. So the summary here is that God often does unexpected things, and this story is no different. Uh, David came to be known as the greatest king on earth, uh, but he started as the smallest, youngest son. God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. 
And then the interesting thing about David is that even he was a great king for Israel, uh, but Israel was waiting for a king who would be even greater, the one called the promised Messiah. And they are separated by many generations, but Jesus is called the Messiah, and he is a descendant of David. And the people of Israel waited a long time for a king like David, and God did not forgive them. So, our question here is, why is God's choice for king here so surprising? What do you think? I think it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's because he's just a little kid at this point. He He's probably not more than your guys' age if he's the youngest one who's out watching the sheep. He's probably in his 14, 15, 16 years old only at this point. Um, all his older brothers are probably better choices than him for king. They know more, they're bigger, they're stronger, but God chooses instead David. So that is our discussion question. Um, uh, I want you to comment, go find your highs and lows and comment your highs and lows and have a good week, everyone. So bye.